Okay, so today's uh, and this week's Torah portion is uh, Acharai Moth. That means after the death, and it uh, talks about after the death of uh, Aharon's two sons, uh, and they uh, offered strange fire. So we're going to begin in um, in Leviticus chapter 16, and it goes through all of 17 and all of 18. Um, we're going to focus mostly on chapter 16 because there's some important things that we have to uh, glean from this uh, chapter, but we also um, have some things that we want to point out in 17 and 18 as well. So chapter 16 really is talking about um, a, a ritual that... Um, is done on the Day of Atonement. Um, and although the Day of Atonement isn't mentioned, it is mentioned that it's the uh, tenth day of the seventh month, which obviously is the Day of Atonement. But it's the, the two goat kind of sacrifice, as long as with some other sacrifices, that has confused a lot of people and really has given way to a lot of uh, false teachings. Um, and that's something that we want to clear up today. Uh, which is, you know, the, uh, the two goats and casting lots and the Azazel goat. So chapter 17 also talks about um, animal sacrifices, and it talks about, um, it, it really is kind of focused on blood, and uh, it, uh, there's a command in there that uh, anytime anyone sacrifices an animal, that it has to be done uh, at the, the uh, tent of appointment, and it has to be uh, uh, a peace offering. So that's uh, an important thing to keep in mind. And, and in verse 10, um, we really want to point out verse 10, and it says that any man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among you who eats any blood, I shall set my face against him, that being who eats blood, and shall cut him off from among his people. So this is the key here, is verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the slaughter place to make atonement for your lives, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the life. That's a really important thing for us to understand because of Yahshua's sacrifice. And this is one of the things that um, Jews will, Orthodox Jews will, will uh, argue with you about and say that, you know, Yahshua couldn't have been a sacrifice because a blood, a blood sacrifice isn't required and, and uh, it's just, uh, it, this one, this very clearly says that, that uh, blood is necessary to cover sins. So that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. And we also want to understand, um, understand that because it's, uh, it's important for us to, to do that because it's going to tie in with what we're going to read in chapter 16. And chapter 18 really goes through a lot of uh, reasons why uh, the people in the land of uh, the Canaanites and uh, were removed from the land and some of their horrible, wicked sins, the abominations that occurred there, and, and uh, some of those were sexual sins, incest, homosexuality, um, bestiality, just awful, horrible abominations that Yahweh said absolutely do not do. Also, uh, sacrificing children to Moloch, which, you know, we obviously have today with uh, our horrible uh, practice of abortion in America. Uh, very clearly, uh, there in, in chapter 18, in verse 21, it uh, uh, has a prohibition against um, sacrificing children. Um, and so Yahweh makes the point, though, that um, these practices defile the people and defiles the land. And it's really something for us to understand that the land becomes defiled because of these abominations. And something that we as uh, living in a land right now that is 
full of abominations, we can also be expected that the land will vomit us out of this land um, when uh, when the uh, the yeah. wickedness is you know comes to the the full extent. And, you know, if we look back in in uh, in uh, Exodus, we find that uh, the uh, the sin of the Amorites was not yet complete, and that's why the uh, uh, children of Israel ended up going to to uh, to uh, Mitzrayim for you know several generations. It turned out 430 years from the time uh, Abraham was given the the uh, was given the uh, covenant until the time they actually left Egypt or left Mitzrayim because the, the sin of the Amorites was not yet complete. Um, and I think that's certainly what's happening in America as Yahweh continues to withdraw the blessings that we have enjoyed for the last several centuries. Um, you can see as things have become uh, more and more wicked in this land and we, we really have to uh, uh, expect that we will see some correction from Almighty Yahweh in the days ahead. So let's go to chapter 16 and um, we're just going to read chapter 16 and, and get a sense of, uh, of this and try to, try to uh, um, understand what Yahweh is talking about here. So in chapter 16 it reads, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aharon as they drew near before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Speak to Aharon your brother, not to come in at all times to the set-apart place inside the veil, before the lid of atonement, which is on the ark, lest he die, because I appear in the cloud above the lid of atonement. Other translations, I think you'll see this uh, in New King James or in King James, it'll say the mercy seat. Uh, with this Aharon should come into the set-apart place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as an ascending offering. And he should put on the set-apart linen long shirt with linen trousers on his flesh and gird himself with a linen girdle and be dressed with a, the linen turban. They are set-apart garments. And he shall bathe his body in water and shall put them on. And from the congregation of the children of Israel, he takes two male goats as a sin offering and one ram as an ascending offering. And Aharon shall bring the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and let them stand before Yahweh at the door of the tent of appointment. And Aharon shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for Azazel. And Aharon shall bring the goat on which the lot for Yahweh fell, and shall prepare it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for Azazel fell is caused to stand alive before Yahweh, to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness to Azazel. And Aharon shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall slay the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself." And shall take a fire holder filled with burning coals of fire from the slaughter place before Yahweh, with his hands filled with sweet incense, beaten fine, and shall bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before Yahweh, and the cloud of incense shall cover the lid of atonement, which is on the witness, lest he die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the lid of atonement on the east side, also in front of the lid of atonement, he sprinkles some of the blood with his finger seven times. And he shall slay the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and shall bring its blood inside the veil, and shall do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the lid of atonement, and in front of the lid of atonement. And he shall make atonement for the set-apart place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgression and all their sins. And so he does for the tent of appointment, which is dwelling with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And no man shall be in the tent of appointment when he goes in to make atonement in the set-apart place until he comes out. 
and he shall make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the slaughter place, that is, before Yahweh, and make atonement for it. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the set apart set, uh, slaughter place all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and set it apart from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has finished atoning for the set-apart place and the tent of the appointment and the slaughter place, he shall bring the live goat. And Aharon shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the crookedness of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins and shall put them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. And the, crook, and the goat shall bear on itself and all their crookedness to, to a land cut off, and he shall send the goat away into the wilderness. Aharon shall then come into the tent of appointment and shall take off the linen garments on which he put on which he went into the set-apart place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in the set-apart place and shall put on his garments and shall come out and prepare his ascending offering and the ascending offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people, and burn the fat of the sin offering on the slaughter place. And he who sent away the goat to the Azazel washes his garments, and shall bathe his body in water. Afterward he comes into the camp. And the bull for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the set-apart place, is brought outside the camp, and they shall burn their skins, their flesh, and their dung with fire. And he who burns them washes his garments and shall bathe his body in water. Afterwards he comes into the camp. And this shall be for you a law forever. In the seventh new moon, on the tenth day of the new moon, you afflict your beings and you do no work, the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on that day he makes atonement for you to cleanse you, to be clean from all your sins before Yahweh. It is a Sabbath of rest for you, and you shall afflict your beings a law forever. And the priest, who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place, shall make atonement, and shall put on the linen garments, the set-apart garments, and he shall make atonement for the most set-apart place, and make atonement for the set-apart appointment, and for the slaughter place, and make atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be... For you, a law forever to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year, as he did Yahweh commanded Moshe. Hallelujah. Okay, so in last week's uh, portion, uh, which was uh, uh, Matzorah, and uh, we saw that uh, in chapter 14 uh, and 15, we saw that uh, the process by work which a person who had been previously affected with this um, skin disorder, and it, the Hebrew word for that is sa'arat, uh, and then healed, would be cleansed and brought back into, into the camp. And it was a process that included something sort of similar to this. And it was two birds, one was sacrificed, the other was released free and alive, there's a seven-day waiting period. There's a washing of body, the body and garments. The eighth day, a new beginning. And then there's uh, a guilt offering, an anoint, uh, oil for anointing, a burnt offering, and a grain offering. So we just read uh, chapter 16. And, uh, and in verse 1, Yahweh reminds us, uh, reminds Moshe about uh, Nadab and Abihu, uh, and the strange fire incident. And now he gives Moshe instructions about the most holy place. And this is, um, you know, in the King James Version, it's going to be uh, translated as the Holy of Holies, uh, the place inside the veil, and how it was to be treated. And we see that only Aharon, or the high priest, is able to come inside the veil, and only once a year on the seventh day, uh, seventh month on the tenth day of the month, and what procedures uh, he has to follow to as he does that, and it starts with dressing properly. He can't just wear anything at all. He's got to put on his priestly garments. Uh, so that's something for us to keep in mind too about how when we come before 
Almighty Yahweh, that we come uh, in uh, dressed in uh, in garments that are you know our best. Uh, also, there's washing. You know, he washes his his body before he puts that on. So we want to come before Yah uh, Yahweh in a in a state of cleanliness and to be clean. Um, <clears throat> So there's two goats, uh, one for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And a bull is offered as a sin offering by Aharon for his own sin. So he has to first offer a sin offering for his, his, own, his own sins. Um, and then, of course, we don't find out until verse 29 that this is to be done on the 10th day of the 7th month, and then find out that it's a Sabbath, or a special Sabbath, a Shabbat Shabbaton. Uh, and so far, the scriptures have revealed the special holy days that have always existed. In Exodus, we learned, uh, we were introduced to the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Pentecost, and... Uh, and now we see that the Day of Atonement, although it's not named specifically that yet, later in chapter 23, all the holy days are laid out in order, and uh, we can see that, see that. So let's take a look about this, these two goats and the casting a lot, the Azazel and scapegoat, and what that is all about. Um, the first thing that we should understand is the two goats are comprised one single offering. They're not two different offerings. Uh, they're not uh, two offerings for two different personalities. They're the same offering with two different purposes. Uh, and we're going to see that here in a little bit. So with the passage of time and the difficulties of translation, the instructions of the two goats are far less clear to us than they were uh, most likely to their original recipients. In particular, the Hebrew word Azazel, used for the second goat, is surrounded by a lot of uh, tradition and speculation and contradictory assertions. The com uh, there's a common belief among Sabbatarians, uh, whether they be sacred name people or um, Church of G.O.D. people and, and uh, you know, just various different people that keep the Sabbath and recognize this, that the Azazel is the name of a wilderness demon, or it represents Hasatan, the, the enemy. Uh, this foundation springs from a conclusion that the Azazel goat, often translated scapegoat, and that's really a mistranslation that was translated uh, from Hebrew into English, uh, that represents Satan. So let's only use the Bible as our source, and we'll find no definitive statement for Azazel representing Satan or Hasatan. What it really, what appears to be instead is that Satan, whose original name was Hillel, co-opted the term to apply to himself in the same way he co-opted one of the titles of Yahshua, that is Lightbringer uh, or Lightbearer, Lucifer, for himself. If we, we can see that in Isaiah uh, chapter 14, verse 12, and uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 19, and uh, Revelation 22, 16. Let's go to Revelation and just kind of see where some of this uh, misunderstanding or mis, uh, this wrong idea about uh, ha Hasatan. Uh, comes from, and it comes towards the end of end of uh, Revelation, and it uh, is uh, we're going to see that in uh, in Revelation chapter twenty. And Revelation chapter 20 says, "And I saw a messenger coming down from the heavens, having a key to the pit of the great." and a great chain in his hand. And he seized the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit of the deep, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he could not lead the na nations no more astray until the thousand years were ended, and after that he has to be released for a little while. 
Um, so when we see this imagery of the two goats in Leviticus 16, um, we see in uh, Leviticus 16 here and uh, verse 21, we see Aaron, Aharon shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the crookedness of the children of Israel and all the transgressions in their sin and shall put on them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. So the imagery here is the fit man it represents the angel who lays hold of Satan, throws him in the bottomless pit. The wilderness is sort of symbolic of the bottomless pit. And we're going to see here in a little while how this is, um, is not really possible for Satan, Hasatan, to be part of the atonement Yahweh provides for his people. That just, first of all, in the, uh, if you just think about it for a minute, that doesn't even make any sense on its, on its, just on its surface. But let's look from scripture and see really what this, what this, uh, what this is all about. Um, so the atonement Yahweh provides for his people. That's a role that only can be filled, fulfilled by Messiah. So Azazel, that word only appears in the Bible four times. Uh, and all of them appear in Leviticus 16. So that, that word means, it identifies two roots for this word. The first root uh, of which means goat or kid. That's um, Hebrews 57, 95. And the second root means to go away hence or to disappear. Uh, Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English lexicon says it means complete removal. These definitions not only fit with the Hebrew, but they also align with the instructions in Leviticus 16. But to start with, Azazel, as the name of a fallen angel, a, a representative of Hasatan or Hasatan himself, is at best to begin with a conclusion, at worst, to base crucial understanding on an apocryphal tradition. When we look at the totality of what scripture says, the very different picture emerges. This idea more than likely originated um, early in the uh, centuries uh, before the common era in the book of Enoch, um, which is an apocryphal book and in several places directly contradicts scripture. So it's not something we want to use to, to uh, establish any doctrine with. Um, by comparing what the Azazel Goat accomplishes with the rest of Yahweh's revelation, its role and thus its identity becomes clear. There is no second, let alone third witness for Satan or Hasatan playing a role within this chapter or in the atonement for sin. So the thing we, we, we really want to understand here is the two kids of the goat together are a single offering. They're not two different offerings. That is, the two young goats are distinct elements that jointly accomplish this offering for sin. Both parts are absolutely required for the offering to be accepted. A typical sin offering consists of only one animal, but this sin offering consists of two. And it shows that something additional is being accomplished here, something beyond just the payment for sin. <clears throat> the biblical sin offering is detailed in, in Leviticus 4. And if uh, you remember in our previous Torah portions that we, we looked at, um, Leviticus 4 is in Wakira. And um, we talk about the burnt offering and the sin offering and... and uh, and is Yahweh's prescribed way to show sins being paid for through a death. While it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, we see that in, in Hebrews 10 and in verse 4, Yahweh still required the blood to be shed to remind people that sin incurs the death penalty. So a critical part of this sin offering involves a priest placing his hand, uh, the high priest, Aharon, placing his hands on the head of the animal before it was slain to show the animal would stand in the place of the party under judgment. So we've talked about this before, about how 
burnt offerings, the sin offerings, when we lay our hands on, on uh, the priest lays his hands on the animal, that's uh, really us taking, uh, taking uh, uh, the animal's place. The animal is taking our place uh, for the, you know, the death penalty that we rightly incur in ourselves. Uh, the unblemished, innocent animal representing the guilty party symbolically receives the guilt. This detail is reiterated four times within the instruction for the sin offering, and you know that's in Leviticus 4, in uh, verse 4, and verse 15, and 24, and 29, as well as the initial consecration ceremony for Aharon and his sons that takes place in, in Exodus 29, verse 10. A sin offering is incomplete without the symbolic transference taking place. So, in Leviticus 16.8 here, uh, has Aharon casting lots, one lot for Yahweh and one lot for a goat of departure, or Azazel, the scriptures renders it. The first biblical occurrence of lots being shown uh, being cast shows that a matter of choosing which goat fulfills which role is completely in Yahweh's hands. The high priest had to wait for Yahweh's decision before continuing. Yahweh does not leave it up to man to choose which would fulfill these roles because of man's inability to choose or judge properly. The matter of the different roles becomes clear after understanding a difficult a difficulty springs up here, though, because of the construction seems to imply two separate personalities. One lot is cast for Yahweh and another for Azazel. However, if we look deeper, we'll see that this phrase for Yahweh is not about identifying a personality at all. Along these lines, Azazel is not a name in the Bible, nor did the live goat represent a second personality, but instead it fulfilled a second purpose. It was chosen to accomplish just what the Hebrew word means, departure, removal, or disappearance. The first goat was for Yahweh because his justice must be satisfied. It was for cleansing of his house, the tabernacle, and his people. The second goat was for an additional step after the penalty for sin was paid completely removing sins from view by bearing them to an uninhabited land. Thus, while many infer that the two personalities are in view and uh, are in view of Leviticus 16.8, the construction does not require it. Rather, the lots were cast to determine which goat would fulfill each role within this compound atonement for sin. There's no scripture that really supports the notion that uh, Hasatan has been chosen to fill any sacrificial role. Yahweh gave Hehelel a role, but he chose his own lot in life when he lifted his heart up in pride and left his first estate. We see that in Jude 6. Yahweh did not choose that for him. Uh, conversely, in Matthew 12 and in verse 18, uh, it quotes a messianic prophet about the servant whom Yahweh chose. Let's go to Matthew 12. Give me a second and just read this. Matthew 12 and in verse 18. It says, and this is quoted actually from, uh, from Isaiah, Yeshayahu in, verse, in chapter 42 in the first four verses. And he says, see my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my being did delight, I shall put my spirit upon him and he shall declare right ruling to the nations. He shall not strive nor cry out, nor shall anyone hear his voice in the streets. A crushed reed he shall not break, and a smoking flax he shall not quench, till he brings forth right ruling forever, and the nation shall trust in his name. So this is, points out that, you know, Yahshua didn't take it on himself. He didn't come up with this idea, I'm going to be the Messiah. Yahweh chose him to be that from the beginning before the foundation of the earth. 
actually. Uh, and similarly, we find in 1 Peter 2.6, it says that Yahshua is, is elect because Yahweh chose him. 1 Peter 2.6. And so we have evidence of the lot applying to Yahshua because Yahweh chose him. He was chosen to fulfill the sin offering, the burnt offering, the meal offering, the Passover, and the wave sheaf as well. As the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about these sacrifices and <laughs> offerings that all point to Yahshua. That's not related to all of them all. What? That's not related to all of them all. No. no. But the scriptures completely preclude Hasatan from receiving any such honor. So what's important for us? So let's go to um, Hebrews. really gives us a lot of light on this, this subject. And we, uh, we can glean some understanding from that. So let's go to Hebrews 8 and start in verse 1. <clears throat> And this helps us understand what was being done in Leviticus 16. And really, from the beginning of the Torah, um, things that the people then just simply did not understand, understand but we, we understand now because we have the benefit of that experience, we have that written down, and we have now the revelation that we have in uh, by by Yahshua and the the men that Yahshua taught. So let's go to chapter 8 of Hebrews and start in verse 1. And it says, Now the summary of what we are saying is, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of greatness in the heavens, who serves in the set-apart place of the true tent, not the copy that was done here on earth, but the true tent which Yahweh set up and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and slaughter. So one, so it was necessary for this one to have someone to offer. For indeed, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. And there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah, who serve, again, a copy of and shadow of the heavenly, as Moshe warned when he was about to make the tent. For he said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent service inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was constituted on better promises. So Messiah is called the mediator of the new or renewed covenant in Hebrews in three places. Here in, in Hebrews 8.6, also in, in 9.15 and in Hebrews 12 and 24. So let's drop down to uh, verse, uh, chapter 9 and get some more understanding about the temple sacrifices and really what these things are and why this makes sense for us today. Because, you know, obviously we don't have a temple, we don't have animals being killed, but that doesn't mean that these sacrifices are done away with. We're not killing animals. But what we do have is, is the sacrifices that were intended from the very beginning and what, uh, what Yahweh was looking for. So chapter 9 says, Now the first covenant indeed had regulations of worship and the earthly set-apart place. For a tent was prepared, the first part, which was the lampstand and the temp table and the showbread, which is called the set-apart place. After the second veil, a part of the tent, which is called the most set apart, or the Holy of Holies, to which belong the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, or overlaid on all sides which go with gold, in which were the golden pot, which held the manna and the rod of Aharon that budded, and the table of tablets of the covenant. And above the carabim of the steam were overshadowing the place of atonement, about which we do not now speak in detail. So this is the important part, and this is the part that where Paul, the writer of Hebrews, it might have been Paul, but uh, the writer of Hebrews explains what's going on in Leviticus 16 for us now. These, and, and verse 6, these having been prepared like this, the priests always went in 
to the first part of the tent accomplishing the services. But into the second part, he's talking about the Holy of Holies, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of ignorance of the people, the set-apart spirit signifying this, that the way into the most set-apart place was not yet made manifest while the first tent was standing. Okay, so, they understand, so he explains further, which was a parable for the present time in which both gifts and slaughters are offered, which are unable to perfect the one serving as to his conscience only as to foods and drinks and different washings and fleshly regulations imposed until a time of setting matters straight. So here's the key. But Messiah, having become a high priest of the coming good manners through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, entered into the most holy place or most set-apart place once and for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats had in the ashes of heifer and sprinkling of the defiled sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh, he asked this question, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the everlasting spirit offered himself unblemished to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? So here we see, this is really what this whole, um, this whole uh, ceremony was really, being, was really being done. It was picturing Yahshua Messiah that would come 1,500 years later, that would come and, off, and, and, and make this offering uh, among many offerings. This is one of them, the Day of the Atonement offering, the two goats. One goat was for Yahweh, the sins of, and, and cleansing the sins of the people. The other goat taken into the wilderness to take our sins away from as far as the east is from the west. So two goats, part of the same offering, accomplishing a complete offering of what uh, Yahshua did for us. And what he continues to do what he continues to do before us, intervening for us, interceding for us as, a, as an intercessor of the new covenant, bringing his own blood onto the altar in the heavens. And that's really the important thing for us to understand. So let's not get mixed up with these false teachings about, you know, the goat and is really Satan, and that's, that's not true. That just clearly... Uh, Hasatan has no part in this, this part of, uh, of uh, the Day of Atonement. This is really bringing us into complete uh, onement with Yahweh. That's what the Day of Atonement really uh, symbolizes. It has really nothing to do at all with the binding of Hasatan. It really has to do with us, uh, the blood of Messiah bringing us into the most holy place, into the holy of holies, with his very own blood, and uh, us being able to approach the, uh, the throne of Almighty Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.